Hello, and thanks for tuning in to the new video on the periodic table. Uh, let's look at the learning target today. Um, it is, I can use the periodic table to predict the properties of elements based on the patterns of their valence electrons. I'm going to make just a little bit of an assumption that you know what valence electrons are. Um, but just in case you need a little bit of a review, remember that valence electrons are the electrons that are in the highest energy level for an atom. All right, so the periodic table, we've already used the periodic table a lot. And um, I want to give you just a little bit of history. There were actually several scientists that contributed to the development of the periodic table. However, it was Henry Mosley in 1913 that determined that if you placed all of the elements in order of their atomic number, a pattern of repeating properties was observed. This became known as the periodic law. Properties of elements can be classified as physical or chemical. As a review, recall that physical properties are those properties that can be measured or observed without changing the sample's composition. So for example, that would be density, melting point, or color. Chemical properties describe the ability or inability of a substance to combine with or change into one or more substances. An example of a chemical property is iron's reaction with oxygen to produce rust or any, any element's reaction with water. The periodic table is a fascinating tool, but we do have to know how to use it. First of all, it's important to know that each horizontal row is called a period. Elements in the same period have their valence electrons in the same energy level. For example, sodium, magnesium, and phosphorus all have their valence electrons in the third principal energy level. I think I made a boo-boo right there. That should say the third principal energy level, not the second principal energy level on the slide. Elements that are in the same column are called groups or sometimes families and they're numbered 1 through 18. So on the picture there, the very small numbers at the top of each column are the group numbers. Elements in the same group have the same number of valence electrons and I put that in red at the top of the columns. So as you can see there, in group 1, all of those elements have one valence electron. In group 2, those all have two. We're going to skip that middle section in groups 3 through 12 for right now um, and mainly concentrate on those elements that are at the end. We call those representative elements. Um, and then you can see in group 13 that those have three valence electrons and so on until you get to group 18, which of course are your noble gases that have eight valence electrons. The number of valence electrons is going to greatly determine how that element reacts with other elements. So it's a super important property of each element. All right, when you're looking at the periodic table, I want you to imagine a stair step line that separates the table into metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. And there's a little picture here I want you to see where the stair step line is. It kind of starts there on the outside of boron and stair steps all the way down through the table. Elements to the right of the stair step line are nonmetals. Nonmetals can be solids, liquids, or gases. And the solids are usually brittle or powdery, kind of like sulfur. They're usually poor conductors of electricity. Elements to the left of the line are metals, except for hydrogen, of course, which is a nonmetal. Usually, um, metals are solids, except for mercury, which is number 80. Um, it's the exception, and it is a liquid at room temperature. 
But most metals have the qualities of being lustrous, which means shiny, and malleable, which means bendable. And metals are usually good conductors of electricity. Elements that border the line are called metalloids. These elements share properties with both metals and nonmetals. Silicon is a common metalloid and it's used in computer chips because it is a good semiconductor. The periodic table can be split into regions that show the sublevel that contain the element's highest energy valence electrons. Now remember that there are four sublevels. There's S, P, D, and F. The S block is where you would find the groups one and two. This is because all elements in this block have their valence electrons in an S sublevel. For example, lithium has one valence electron in the 2s sublevel, and beryllium has two electrons in the 2s sublevel. And if you want to flip back and remember that lithium is in group 1, so it has one valence electron, and beryllium is in group 2, so it has two valence electrons. Both of those elements have their valence electrons in that s sublevel. All elements in groups 1 and 2 are in the s block. The P block groups are groups 13 through 18. All elements in the P block have either partially or fully filled P sublevels. Group 18 elements, which are the noble gases, are unique because they have completely filled S and P sublevels. This makes them very stable. And then the D block, which is that middle part again, I call it the bridge, groups 3 through 12. These are called transition metals. Um, we're not going to talk about those too much, but the D block has uh, atoms that have partially or fully filled D orbitals. And then the F block is the section of the periodic table that's separate from the other, from the main part of the periodic table. The first row is called the lanthanides, and the second row is called the actinides. Both of those rows of elements have partially or fully filled F orbitals, or the F sublevel. Um, but we won't really talk much about F block elements. All right, elements that have the same number of valence electrons tend to behave in the same way. So I just want to do a really quick highlight of what these elements are like, what each group of elements are like. So the group 1 elements are called the alkali metals. That excludes the very first one, hydrogen. But alkali metals have one valence electron, and it is in the S sublevel. They, all of these elements are very reactive with water and air and they combine easily with halogens to make salt. So a good example here would be sodium from the alkali metal group and chlorine from the halogen group that makes table salt. Group two elements are called the alkaline earth metals. These metals are actually really similar to the alkali metals in the way they react with other elements, except that they have two valence electrons in the S sublevel. They are also reactive with air and water, and I don't have a bullet for it, but they will also combine with halogens to make salt. Um, a good example is calcium chloride, which is road salt, which is what they use on the roads to help de-ice in the winter. The group 3 through 12 are your transition metals. Um, transition metals are called transition metals because there have a variety of numbers of valence electrons. There's really not a good pattern. Um, and so we will actually talk about those 
types of metals a little bit later on. Um, the really cool thing about the transition metals is that they react with many elements to make colorful compounds that are used in pigments and dyes. And then group 17 are the very familiar halogens. These elements have seven valence electrons. They are highly reactive with alkali metals and alkaline earth metals um, to produce salt. So we already talked about that. And then the last group are the noble gases. We probably are already familiar with these facts too. They have eight valence electrons and they are very non-reactive. And that is because the noble gases have completely full S and P sublevels. All right, so that's gonna get us started on understanding the periodic table. And um, I look forward to seeing you soon. Have a great day.